let's talk about the collision theory in the context of rates of reactions. In order for a chemical reaction to take place, in other words, in order for A and B, these reactants, to be converted or turned into these products C plus D, what needs to happen is that collisions between the molecules or particles need to take place. So if we have a reaction between A and B, the molecules or particles of A will collide with the molecules or particles of B. So when I say collision, I mean molecules or particles literally colliding, but not all collisions lead to a reaction. These are called ineffective collisions. So if you take a look at this diagram over here, I've got some molecules or particles colliding with each other. There they're colliding. And then afterwards, they kind of carry on in different directions, but you see they haven't changed. So we have these two little white things, these two, and then these two red things, and it ends up being the same thing. So this was not an effective collision. No new products were made. We need effective collisions for a chemical reaction to occur. So if you take a look at this diagram over here, you can see that the different atoms or molecules or particles are colliding with each other. Here's the collision. Maybe they change. If you take a look at these two photos or pictures over here, they change their orientation with which they collided. So maybe instead of colliding like this, they collided like this. Do you see what I'm saying? So they changed the orientation and that caused an effective collision. And can you now see that we have created new products? So this was a effective collision. It resulted in a reaction. This was not an effective collision, no reaction. So what causes an effective collision? Well, these are the two criteria over here that need to be met in order for a collision to be effective. Okay, so this is called the collision theory. And the collision theory says that particles or molecules must have, they must possess sufficient kinetic energy that is equal to or greater than the activation energy. You will recall the activation energy from earlier on. Remember, it is the minimum energy required for a reaction to take place. If we look at our energy diagrams, remember they look like this, something like that. That's an exothermic reaction. This energy over here, the energy that needs to be taken in over here, is called the activation energy, the minimum energy needed for a reaction to take place. So what they're saying is that particles must have energy that is at least equal to the activation energy or greater than the activation energy. So otherwise the reaction is not going to be um, successful. The collision will not be effective. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is particles must have the correct orientation. In other words, they need to collide. They need to collide in a specific way. So maybe they can't collide like this. Maybe the collision needs to take place like this. The orientation needs to change. So if we take a look at this diagram over here, just to illustrate the one criteria, which is that we need enough energy. Your particles or molecules need to have kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy has to do with motion, has to do with movement. So your particles or your molecules must have kinetic energy that is equal to or greater than the activation energy. So here we got A and B. Here they are colliding. But over here it says colliding or collision without the required activation energy. So let's pretend that the activation energy is, let's say, 400. I'm not going to put a unit to it. Let's just work with amounts now. And these particles, let's say they don't have 400. Let's say that their energy is 300. They don't have energy that is greater than or equal to the activation energy. And so no effective collision takes place. No reaction. You can see it was A and B, they do collide, but it's not effective, so there's no reaction. So A and B just continue off as normal. But if they collide over here and they have enough kinetic energy that is equal to or greater than the activation energy, so maybe the energy is 500 or 400, can be equal to, then the collision will be effective and new particles or molecules will form because the reaction would have happened. If you take a look at these diagrams over here, this is showing the correct orientation criteria that needs to be met. So here it says we've got this little molecule here with the green and the little smaller white little circle, and we've got another molecule up here. Can you see in the first picture, there's a little tick mark. So look at how this molecule is orientated. They are colliding in such a way that that orientation will result in an effective collision. Here, basically what they did is they flipped the green molecule around that's not the correct orientation. Think of it as like putting a lock in a key or a key in a lock. Only certain keys will work in a lock. 
if you have the wrong key, you can't unlock the door. Does that make sense? So it has to fit in the correct orientation or the reaction will not occur. The collision will not be effective. So they basically just showing you orientate the particles, but only a certain orientation will result in effective collisions, which will therefore result in a reaction. So just to summarize so far, for a reaction to take place, particles or molecules must collide, but the collisions must be effective collisions. And how do we get effective collisions? The particles or molecules must have kinetic energy that is equal to or greater than the activation energy. That is criteria number one, checkbox number one, and the orientation must be correct. Now, remember what I said in the previous lesson, it's all about increasing the rate of the reaction. So having reactions happen as fast as we can possibly make them happen. So how do we increase the rate of reaction? Well, we need effective collisions. So if we can increase the number of effective collisions that happen in a space of time, then we can increase the rate of reaction. So we can increase the rates of reaction so we can make the reactions happen faster by increasing the number of effective collisions per unit time. When we measure rate of reaction, we are always dividing by time. We need to say we need to increase the number of effective collisions per unit time. It doesn't just help to increase the number of effective collisions overall. It's about increasing the number of effective collisions in the shortest amount of time that we can as well. So increasing the number of effective collisions per unit time will increase the rate of reaction. So if we think about this scenario, I have the same situation over here, same number of particles, let's say the same substance, I have a cold beaker, and then I have the same situation, but in a hot beaker. Just think about what would happen and which one would have a higher or faster rate of reaction. Well, in the colder beaker, remember, Temperature is related to the speed of the molecules, the kinetic energy. Temperature is related to average kinetic energy. So the colder, the beaker, the slower the movement of my molecules and my particles, the lower the kinetic energy. And if I heat that same beaker up, you can see the particles start to vibrate. They start to move faster. And think about it. If their speed increases, their kinetic energy increases, it does increase the frequency with which they are colliding with each other. They have higher kinetic energy. It increases the number of collisions. We also have more collisions over here, as I said. And the very important thing is, what does the collision theory say? So it will have higher EK of particles in situation number two versus in situation number one. And one of my criteria of the collision theory is that only particles with kinetic energy that is equal to or greater than the activation energy will collide effectively. So because situation number two, overall, the EK of the particles is higher, the average kinetic energy is higher. Therefore, there will be more particles with kinetic energy that is greater than or equal to the activation energy that makes sense. And therefore, there will be more collisions, therefore more effective collisions per unit time. And the more effective collisions we have per unit time, it therefore means that we will have a higher rate of reaction. So one of the things that we can do in order to increase the rates of reaction, and we can explain it using the collision theory, is we can increase the temperature of the reaction mixture. And it all goes back to the collision theory because the more particles we have that have kinetic energy that is greater than or equal to activation energy, there'll be more collisions. There will be more effective collisions per unit time, therefore higher rates of reaction. These poor little particles over here, they have lower kinetic energy overall. So there will be way less of them. There will be fewer of them that have a kinetic energy that is greater than or equal to the activation energy because overall their activation, their kinetic energy is very low. So there won't be a lot of them that'll have enough kinetic energy. Remember, the kinetic energy needs to meet a specific threshold in order for the collisions to be effective. So the rate of reaction here will not be as high. Another way we can increase the rate of the reaction is to just create more particles. So if I had to have a situation like this where I had very few particles versus this where I had a lot more particles for the same volume. So let's say both of these is one cubic centimeter in terms of volume. You can see the volume is the same. So if you think of this formula over here, the volume for both of these are the same. Okay, same volume. However, this number two, situation number two, 
has a lot more particles. The N is a lot bigger. So therefore, the concentration of situation two is a lot bigger. And why would that cause the reaction rates to be higher? If I have more particles, just think about it. There's more particles in the same volume. There will be more collisions. So these little guys and girls are going to bump into each other a lot more frequently than these ones over here because there's very few of them over there. So the more they bump into each other, the more they collide, the more frequent their collisions, then there's just a better chance that there will be more effective collisions per unit time. Because remember, just because they are colliding and bumping into each other doesn't mean it's effective. But the more they're going to be bumping and colliding, the more frequent the collisions, the more frequent the effective collisions will be as well. And therefore, the rate of the reaction will be higher. So the more particles we have, the faster the particles we move, the, the, are moving. So the higher the average kinetic energy. Or maybe we decrease the volume. So say we had these three particles over here versus, let's say, situation number three. I let's say I'll halve the volume. So now it's 0 0.5 cubic centimeters. I've halved the volume, so I've increased the pressure. It's the same amount of particles, but in a smaller volume. Do you see that? If we're speaking in terms of gas, I'm speaking in terms of gas, we've squashed the same amount of particles, but in a smaller volume. So the pressure has increased. These little particles are going to bump into each other more often, more frequently. So there will also then be more effective collisions per unit time and therefore higher rate of reaction. And this all can be tied back to the collision theory. It is essential that you realize that it is the number of effective collisions per unit time. Now, if you're doing this section and you are asked to argue in terms of the collision theory, why increasing the temperature increases the rate of the reaction, you need to mention the words effective collisions per unit time, just like I've written it over here. Because if you don't write that, you will lose your marks. It is that that increases the rate of reaction. And that is an overview of the factors that in affect the rate of chemical reactions. It's all linked to the collision theory. So I say over here, you need to be able to explain how all of these factors affect the rate of the reaction in terms of the collision theory. I gave you a little bit of an overview of some of those factors now. In the next video lesson, we will go over this in more detail and link it to the collision theory. I'll see you then. Subscribe if you haven't. Bye, everybody.